Okay, let's go ahead and find your seats. Um, those are back by the door. Please have uh, people come on in. Breaks never seem to be long enough, but we do have uh, ample time for, after this presentation, we have our lunch, so you'll have ap ample opportunity to interact as well. Okay, we mentioned earlier one of the uh, committee members and chair of the National Western Stock Show International Committee is uh, Bill Wales. Uh, Bill's been a longtime member of the faculty here at CSU in animal science. Um, he unfortunately is uh, ill, so he's not able to be here. But uh, one of the contributions he made was he identified our next speaker at an event that, uh, that he attended and said, I have a speaker we have to have at the International Livestock Forum. And he heard, them, heard him on the East Coast. Uh, he said he will, uh, he's very uh, energetic. He has a different view of the meat industry, uh, has a passion for that, has come up through it. And he said he's even been on the Food Channel and had, has, has had a uh, um, reality show that followed him around and so forth. So if he looks familiar to you, it may be why. Uh, so I'd like to introduce to you um, Pat LaFrieda, who is a third generation meat purveyor, providing uh, meat to the New York City area. And uh, I was going to play a video, and he said, no, I'd like to give a little background and get started from there. So I'm going to turn it over to Pat. I'd also like, uh, Kent, to thank uh, you and Elanco for uh, uh, helping provide uh, sponsorship for him to be here and uh, Midwest PMS as well. That relationship uh, is why he's here. So, um, Pat, glad to have you here. Floor is Pleasure yours. Pleasure to be here. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I am Pat LaFrieda, Pat LaFrieda III. My great-grandfather, Antonio LaFrieda, immigrated into the United States in 1906 with five children, and then once in America had two more children. So five boys, two girls. The last one born was my grandfather. He was born on St. Patrick's Day, and that's how the name Patrick came to be. Um, so now there's also Patrick IV. He's 11 years old. He's about this big. Uh, it was one of those family things that uh, I was told at a ver very early age, probably around eight or nine years old, your first, first son's name has to be Patrick. That's what uh, how do you make a son? You know, it was very <laughs> so when I first, one of the first dates with my wife, uh, I, I told her, by the way, when we have a son, it's got to be Patrick. And she just looked at me uh, like, we're getting married? Uh, <laughs> well, even if we don't, the child's name is going to be Patrick. <laughs> but in... It, every time I listen to um, experts speak about the beef industry, I, I always learn more about it, and it, it truly is helpful. In the Northeast, we feel, uh, as meat purveyors, that we don't get much support, much education, um, and there are a lot of conflicting, um, there's a lot of conflicting data that, that doesn't really help us, and we decided early on, I guess that dates back three generations, um, that we were going to support American farms. About 15 years ago, this local movement came to, to be, and I, I, I understand that could be good and bad, um, but when I have chefs ask me for locally sourced beef, I explain, you know, there's nothing that you're wearing uh, and the phone that you're speaking to me on is not even from America. Let's worry about American farmers and let's worry about domestic product. And if we could get great product locally, fantastic. And if not, we'll find an American farm that will grow the product that we're looking for. Um, and that usually ends that conversation. Um, but back to the family business, my... Um, we just celebrated our 100th year in business. So in 1915, my great-grandfather opened the first retail butcher shop in Queens and Brooklyn, New York. And it wasn't until 1922 did we open 
for restaurant supply. So the labor unions in New York City are um, very tough, and there was a strike, and if you wanted meat in New York City, it had to go through the 14th Street meat market. And that's when uh, trains still brought in the beef supply. Uh, that's when conductors from out west would hit New York City, and the train would get held up, and they died of heart attacks because they had, they're like, really? My train's getting held up like it would out west in New York City? Um, when, when the train would get held up, it would stop before the 14th Street market in the 20s, and the beef would just be thrown off the rails onto the, onto the pavement about 35 feet below where there were luggers waiting for the product, and they just loaded it right into trucks and, and took off with it. So um, at one point, about 30% of all meat in New York City was black market. Uh, which I always find very interesting as opposed to uh, right now. I mean, at a certain point, the FBI came in and made it a federal law to, to uh, steal beef, to, to protect the beef industry. Um, when there was a strike, my grandfather and his older brothers would drive to farms in New Jersey and upstate New York and bring me back underneath the... Uh, or in the shadows of the union and supplied restaurants. And that's how they got their first grip into the uh, industry. Um, my grandfather passed away in 89. Uh, my father had taken over the business. I was a freshman in college when I got the phone call that he had passed away. And from that moment on, I always felt like I would go into the family business. But it's the last thing my dad ever wanted me to do. I, I was the generation that was supposed to go off and do something bigger and better in life. Although, ever since the age of about 10, any day I had off from school was working for my dad. So if anyone's accustomed to a family business here, you'll understand what I mean. Um, your day off was a day at work helping out the family. And I always felt like if my family business died, it was almost like the family would die. And my dad losing his father, I, I could see he, he, he didn't have the um, energy and, and the stamina anymore to, to compete against, at the time, 250 different meat companies in a very small area. Um, I graduated college with a finance degree. I, I immediately got a job on Wall Street, and he was happy. I was going to work dressed in a suit like this. And that felt great for about a week. I, hate, I hated it. Selling intangibles to strangers over the telephone was, especially knowing that they would probably lose money, uh, it was the worst feeling in the world. And in a, about nine or ten months, I had went to my, back to my dad and said, Dad, I would really love to take over the family business. Not take over. Uh, join the family business and expand it. At the time, they only had 44 restaurants that they were selling to. Um, they worked five days a week. I, I saw the inefficiencies. I saw the lack of marketing, the lack of inge ingenuity, and the lack of, but, but the, all of the experience was there. And I, ju it, I really believed in my heart that it just needed fresh blood to come in and, and, to, um, and to take over in those areas. My father's sister, may she rest in peace, she was his partner, and she was just retiring, and she was like the mob boss of the family. And I went to see her when my dad turned me down. And uh, she convinced my father to let me come in, and we now service 1,500 restaurants. We are as far west as Vegas, as far south as Miami. Uh, we work six days a week, 24 hours a day. And we are about 70 times larger than we were when I started. So now when we look back, my dad's like, I spent all of your education, all of, all of my money on your education for this reason. You were destined to, to, to be in this business. And I'm like, no, dad. It's because Lisa asked, my Aunt Lisa asked you and forced you to uh, bring me into the business. Um, we... <laughs> We were um, very fortunate to be on a lot of 
television programs. It's the one thing my dad hates. So um, the Food Network did a reality TV show on us. And we were um, fortunate in, in that regard, uh, but unfortunate. 22 cameramen following us around the USDA inspected plant uh, 24 hours a day, it was really difficult. So if we already worked 16 hour days, it, they became 22 hour days. And my dad, he's old school. He's not the most politically correct person in the world. So at a certain point, Scripps, who owns Food Network, sat me down and said, hey, we could use about 15% of your dad's content. So <laughs> you better... <laughs> <laughs> So you have to tell them to tone it down a bit and uh, be a little nicer to everyone. And I'm like, no, 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 he doesn't mean anything by it. Like, we, we, we know that, but this is a family network. Um, so it was, it was no surprise to me that he was the audience's most favorite character um, because he was the one person who didn't want to be on TV. Um, and what I'm about to show you is uh, one of the latest uh, things that we filmed it should be, um, it's an ad campaign that Budweiser's doing. Budweiser wants in on the burger business. They want to be like this. They want to be known as the beer to drink with burgers because burgers are the new hot thing. They're 12 years or 13 years behind schedule. Um, <laughs> they're just realizing now that burgers are not going anywhere. Uh, so I figured this would be a nice... Um, it's so a little bit of a break from all the graphs. I have plenty of graphs also. I, like you guys have seen enough of that, so we'll uh, play this. Colt, what am I doing here? There we go. Is there volume? That's okay. Would it come on here? Uh, yeah, it should. And then uh, we probably have a mic. Well, you said mic public. Yeah, that'd be great. I went from finance to meat, not technical support, so sorry about that. Butchers would never even conceive of grinding. 
you put that much thought into what goes into the burger, you want to keep it as simple as possible. American cheese, sweet pickles, because they're my dad's favorite, on a potato bun, that's a butcher burger. Throughout all of our successes, there's never been that high five moment between my dad and I. My dad, he's old school. I know, I see that glimmer in his eye, and secretly, I know he's proud. Notice the gold jewelry, by the way. <laughs> Switch over. So, that was really to show a little bit of the passion that we have for our business. It, it, it's not a business as much as it, as it is our life. And um, this past October, New York City has a food and wine festival. And it's magnificent. It's probably 80 events in four days in different places, sometimes simultaneously, sometimes um, one-offs. There's a burger bash uh, in which 5,000 people attend. Rachel Ray and I host it ourselves. Um, it's a great event. During that weekend, the Wall Street Journal, usually a very good friend and still is of the meat industry, had me on a panel and I was doing a few things at once. I was roasting an entire steer, so dressed weight 875 pounds, in a Kahashina box, if anyone's familiar with what that is. That is a big box that is enclosed the meat goes inside the box, and over the top is stainless steel, I should just say steel, where charcoal is, is light on top and, and lit. And for 24 hours, we roast it in that radiant heat, cooks it in a way that you, you just can't match it any other way. It's usually used for pigs in the Cuban um, community in Miami. And a Cuban-American who served in World War II uh, actually came back with the idea because he found those boxes to be very efficient and a great way to cook pigs in China. Brought that idea to, back to the United States. And if you look up Caja China, you'll find this guy, Roberto. Um, he's made a fortune selling these boxes. That wasn't good enough for us. We wanted to do an entire steer, and he told us we were crazy. So we welded a box ourselves, uh, 12 feet by 8 feet, and all we did was butterfly an entire steer with a forklift, drop it in there, and um, at the end, we lift the whole crate out and place it on top, and we carved the entire steer down for the audience. And I think... We hit a record, so we went through that in 45 minutes. And I cut a, cut a lot of meat with these hands. It's the only time I've ever gotten blisters on my hands from uh, cutting. Um, it's, it's pretty magnificent. So that was on Sunday, so the day before on Saturday was this panel, and I was supposed to go for the lighting of the steer to make sure it was lit and my chefs that were going to be monitoring it overnight, which is a great job because I give them a lot of beer and a lot of charcoal, and all they have to do is sit there and monitor the temperatures and make sure they have enough charcoal on. Um, and on my way back, I got hit by a car. Uh, my vehicle got struck by a car. I only caught the last two seconds of it, and my heart rate went to about 120 beats per minute. As I saw um, a lady texting, had no idea she was coming at me and I smashed into the median. I jumped out of the car as if I was a criminal, and I Ubered a vehicle, so it's a taxi for anyone that's not familiar with Uber, because um, I needed to get to the, to the journal um, panel. But before that, I still needed to light the steer so I could serve the 1,000 people on Sunday. Um, we hit so much traffic because now I was behind schedule I would put my heart rate at 130 beats per minute. I called my chefs. I said, guys, you have to light this yourself. I can't be there. I, I have to go straight to the uh, panel. I get to the panel. It had started already. 
So I walk in and there's three chefs, the three of my customers, no less. Heart rate about 150 beats per minute. And as soon as I sat down, someone stood up in the back and said, I have a question for Pat LaFrida. Well, that was quick. Um, 160 beats per minute. I'm like, yes. Um, this person stood up, and you would think they would take out like a four by six or three by five photo. I mean, this was like a 12 by 18 photo that had to have wrapped around his back. <laughs> and it was a photo of his pet dog. I turned to the chef to my right, and I said, where the heck is this going? Um, about 170 beats per minute. And for about three minutes, he explained how that was his pet. It had gotten cancer and suffered for the last six months of, it, of its life. Previous to that, it would wait for him at the doorstep to come home every day. And that the dog lived for him. I was like, and? He said, well, Pat LaFrida, how dare you do that to animals every day in, in killing beef? My heart, rate, my heart rate went back down to 60 beats per minute. I put my feet up on the desk, and I'm like, this is simple. I, mean, I was more in my comfort zone from someone that ignorant asking a question like that. Now the chefs were clearly panicked. The next person stood up with their 12 by 18. I mean, it just, PETA had gotten into this event, and they were embedded, and they all stood up. And I said, hold on, hold on, everyone relax. You needed comfort in your life. You caused a demand for a pet. That pet was produced for you. If you didn't have that demand, if you weren't so needy, animal would never have existed, it would never have suffered, if you want to look at it that way. Our beef, although we don't kill it, uh, but we're very proud of the people who do, they exist because we have a demand to eat protein. And if I can only show you their faces, they, it's like they lost the battle. I look to my right, the three chefs are writing down verbatim what I, and they're asking me permission to use it in the future. I'm like, use what? It's just off the top of my head, it's the truth. Um, the journal came and stopped the event. I was like, whoa, hold on, this is perfect. I, I'm not gonna tell anyone else what to eat or what not to eat. I just wanna give my perspective. Um, vegetarians often at tables, at, you know, in New York City, there are no golf courses, so we conduct business at, at the, dis at the uh, dinner table in restaurants. And often people will lean over and say, hey, I'm, I'm real sorry, I'm a vegetarian. But I'm not going to talk you out of being one. Just don't talk me out of eating my, my beef, because that's what I want to eat. Um, so looking back at it, I guess if of all the beef consumed in, in the Northeast, if I'm the guy they targeted, I must be doing something right. Because when, um, most recently, when the uh, World Health Organization came out and said, nitrites and nitrates are bad for you. They're bad for you, okay. Uh, in addition, red meat may also be bad for you. May? You put a, an example like that um, onto, onto the air, and within, within moments, I'll show you a great photo. I get a phone call from Brooke Baldwin from CNN. You never know which way CNN's going to go. So she called me and she said, Pat, I need you in here right away. You need to, de to debunk this red meat issue. I said, okay, I'm gonna stay away from the nitrites and the nitrates, that's not new news. Too much of that may cause cancer, too much of that. Um, I did add how that kills botulism and how it kills listeria and does more good than bad. 
but debunked the idea of, of red meat with no data, no science behind that claim. Um, so I was on my way to a meeting with a, with a client. I said, what time shall I be there tomorrow? She's like, I need you here in an hour. So I had to cancel my appointment, run home, get into a suit, and get back to Baldwin because of my passion for, for the industry and because of her appearance. Um, she's a beautiful woman, and so, <laughs> someone I can't say no to. And um, all of a sudden felt great that I was representing the beef industry, but uh, where is NAMI? Somewhere here. There you are. I was, I, I felt like I, I needed some support, and you can't be everywhere, and the, the organization can't be anywhere. But I, I, I'd have to say in real time, I, I was probably the first to, to represent the beef industry in a positive light after that news, and I just think that it's hysterical that this past week the administration came out and said, hold on now, eating lean meat is good for you doesn't cause cancer, cut some, cut some of the sugar out of your diet. I mean, which is it? Now, can we rely on, on the government anymore to tell us what to eat and what not to eat? It, it, they, there's, there's so much confliction in, in, um, in those answers um, and, and what they tell us. So as a meat purveyor, what, what are my jobs? Sure, my job is to get meat to a restaurant, make sure the price is correct. I don't know if anyone knows the logistics of New York City in getting meat to a restaurant. But last year, I'm sorry, yeah, 2015, I am at $210,000 in parking tickets. Parking tickets are not tax deductible, so it comes off the bottom line. Uh, God forbid we were ever audited, so it's a huge um, endeavor. But at the same time, I'm a consultant. Chefs call me when they plan to open restaurants. They ask me what to put on the menu. They ask me where to source beef from. When they have ideas of the example I gave earlier about um, local beef, you know, that's a great example of, of a myth that I need to debunk. But if you have to backtrack a little more, if you're a chef and you've just spent $12 million on a restaurant that you don't own, that's just to lease it and to renovate it, you can imagine they want to be different from the next restaurant. So what is that? Is that sourcing local meat? Is that, um, in, this ca in the case of that restaurant they just opened, they, o they thought that they wanted to dry age beef in-house. Not that it was one of those um, glass encased units that the public got to see. It was a beautiful room down in the basement, and they just wanted to control it in-house. But they didn't consult with me on that and wound up throwing away 240 ribeye primals because the dehumidifiers they used were ones for someone's home that um, can't take moisture out of the air if the air is 40 degrees or below. Uh, moisture just doesn't condensate in that environment. So when black mold was growing through the door, that's when they called me and uh, <laughs> made them discard everything, rebuild the room with a desiccant system to take the moisture out of the room, and uh, now they have a really fantastic product. Um, so. You know, as a meat purveyor, it's, I, I always want to be able to tell my consumers the right answer. I, I want them to be well informed, and in order for that to happen, I need to be well informed. So some examples from today, which are confusing f a little bit from yesterday. Uh, in one of the graphs, we showed Australia you know, as, a, as another great source, uh, or I should say another great beef producer. And in any Middle Eastern project that, w that, so in the Middle East, they love Western concepts. Shake Shack being 
I don't know if anyone here is familiar with that burger chain. It's a concept that is mine. I made it for Danny Meyer. Danny Meyer took that company public, and that was kind of my full circle back to the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, and he did very well with it. My job was, was uh, to procure the meat and to make him a burger grind that was, was great for him. Um, let me show you that photo. He was in, I was invited with him to, uh, to ring the bell for the exchange that day. So that's Danny on the right. I think he just uh, cashed out of his stocks. I think it was about a half a billion dollars. Um, and that's all of us up there ringing the bell that day. That was my, like I said, I'll jump into that. that. I mean, I left Wall Street wearing a suit to jeans and a fleece and then back around to Wall Street again, never to think it would be because of meat and the fact that I had helped them make a burger grind that was really different. That's really what started the burger trend. So in the industry, I'm kind of demonized by where the price of briskets are. Because briskets are a part of my grandfather's recipe. It was a, I only made slight tweaks to my grandfather's recipe for that recipe. Um, and there are only so many briskets on an animal and the barbecue industry owned all of those previous to this. So uh, now there are many spin-offs, but in the Middle East, they want American products, so they, but according to the politics, they may not always get it. What's the backup? Australia. So not to pick on NAMI, which I always formally knew as NAMP, what was the purchasing book that we all relied on? One of the greatest books to the industry that helped clarify the cuts, which was the, the NAMP book, correct? The Meat Buyer's Guide. The last 25 I bought, and I, I buy so many because when a customer comes in to see me and I show them some of the cuts and flip through, um, they always take the book with them. And they think, what does it retail for? 120 bucks or something like that? Yeah, <laughs> the past edition was sponsored by who? Australia. It's a whole introduction about Australian beef. And how am I just consulting with a chef, explaining that uh, you know, domestic beef and domestic lamb, and I'm showing him the meat buyer's guide by, by NAMP, like, you know, which to me always represented American uh, beef processors. And it's really one big advertisement for, for Australian beef. So I hope they gave you guys a lot of money for that and we were able to turn that around into American dollars. But um, so again, just more data that conflicts and like Kent knows every time um, Kent from Alanco, I, I, I normally call whenever a, uh, the news is because the news is centralized in New York City and there is a meat issue on the first person they call. They don't, there's no one else to call. Then I call Ken and I'm like, Ken, can you please tell me, <laughs> debunk some of these things for me and tell me like what's really going on here. The Cool Act, Chandler, I, we, you spoke a lot about that. Um, we, we want access to the Chinese market, correct? Um, is it one of the reasons that we can't or China won't buy product from us is because we, we have no traceability. And I thought that the COOL Act, if anything else, was a way to start some of that traceability. And the fact that we couldn't tell Japan back when we had BSE where that animal originated, um, it originated in Canada, was fed feed from Europe, and because we didn't really have traceability then. It is really what, what shut the door on, on a lot of that exportation. So I agree. 
I, I, I personally think that, that beef exportation, it's, it's one of our last resources as a country, and I, I only want to grow that. And it, it's, it's great when the concepts in the Middle East, like Shake Shack, they first expanded in the Middle East. So imagine we had to become certified halal, make American product um, under halal uh, restrictions, and then export it to the Middle East. Again, you heard earlier about meat on a ship being held up at customs overseas. You're worrying about, first, if you're ever going to get paid. I served in the Army for eight years. Heck, if I'm going over there. Um, I was, they asked me many times to go. You know, it, it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a great transaction if the beef does get accepted there because I always thought, you know, we, we constantly complain about American dollars going to the Middle East for oil and not coming back. That was our one way to bring it back. But I should say that was my one way, my little my little sector of of the industry, and an idea that I had for a burger chain, and the fact that they were now now sending American dollars back to the U.S. Like we were very proud of that, um, and we still are. Because of politics, when that door gets closed, they have a backup ready to go, which is Australia. Now, they just can't call Australia in the last moment and say, hey, I need a load of four-ounce pucks made of clod, brisket, uh, chuck flap tail, and chuck, just like that. So I lose about 20% of the business on a regular basis because they have to keep that going. They have to keep Australia, um, they have to use, use Australian beef now so that if there is an emergency, Australia won't say, hey, 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 no, no. You're not going to get it because you don't normally buy from us. Um, so another way, so a lot of this is perspective and where we sit in, in the beef sector. Because we pride ourselves on domestic product, when we bid, let's say, center cut New York strip steaks against another meat purveyor, and the other meat purveyor doesn't need to say that it's from Uruguay. How much better is the yield on product from there? Much better. Puts us at a disadvantage of about 25%. So we're 25% higher in our pricing, and the competitor doesn't have to say what country it's from. Once it hits America, it's domestic product again. So, you know, it, it does have its pros and cons, and I, I completely understand about Canada and Mexico being upset but what were they upset about? American consumers were choosing American product over Canadian and um, Mexican product. I didn't think that was such a bad thing. They were suing us for th $3 billion to the World Trade Organization. I always thought that was a cheap number. Um, if that was going to keep American ranchers um, and growers successful, um, but then I came to, f to find out that that's not necessarily al always the case. If we have a deficit for um, livestock, we need to get it from somewhere. So if they started in Mexico and finished here, it's a different story. But as you can see how complicated that is, and I, I'm really focused to, to this group because, I mean, you're who you're going to be out there waving that flag. And it's such a complicated subject, and there are so many underlying um, themes in it and, and motivations that, that it's, it's not clear cut. So having this conversation at 2 AM with a chef, um, yeah, those go into like 5.30 AM uh, completions. You know, and I still have to get back into production and make sure everything's going well over there. So um, basically, in a nutshell, it's a very complicated business. And uh, the more, I, I personally think the more um, we educate the public, the more we will, I think the easier our lives will be. 
I mean, just to look back, when I first started with my dad, the idea that a USDA inspector requires an office inside of our building and had to be there every day, do a preoperative inspection, could possibly tag something and leave, meaning that we were closed until they came back from the coffee break or wherever the heck they disappeared to. You know, it's more regulated than a nuclear power, power plant. So it, it's a very complex, complicated um, industry. And like my dad says, you know, restaurants pay, we pay our suppliers in about seven to 10 days. Our restaurants pay us in about 45. We dry age beef. Uh, there's a good, good photo here of, of our dry aged beef program. Um, this was a food blogger. Uh, I also think and the reason that I was initially showing this photo is because this food blogger loved meat. And I was hesitant about bringing or allowing him in because he had asked permission to come in. And he seemed legitimate and he seemed sincere. Uh, as you can see, all our, all of our dry aged beef, it's like a library. We have 7,000 primals like that hanging. So if I have to pay for that in seven to 10 days, and we're dry aging up to 120 days, and then waiting 45 days to get paid. It takes a lot of money to fund that, and it takes a lot of time. It took generations to be able to finance that. Um, at, the end of, at the end of the year, and this could be a completely different uh, class, the finances in the IRS, um, they don't care that you didn't collect the money yet. You're paying taxes on as if it was paid. So at a later date, you may be able to claim that it was uncollectible and write it off. But what you're witnessing there is you know, product that may never get paid for that we already paid tax on as if we sold it. So back to what my dad was saying, anyone that wants to get into that business, that has the money to get into that business, wouldn't want to be in that business. Um, Besides the fact that there are less and less butchers every day. When I first started selling whole primals of, let's say, those are 179s and those are short loins, we would sell whole primals to restaurants. They had butchers on staff. They had bandsaws. There are no butchers or bandsaws in restaurants anymore. Everything is portion controlled um, for the most part. And it, you know, the butchers that we have, we made them. There are very few, very few courses or classes anymore to be able to um, train butchers. And if you think about it, the only way you can really learn to be a butcher is to be in an environment like that, where a lot of product is running through and you're able to practice every day. You can imagine how expensive it would be for a culinary institute to teach a chef how to cut meat if um, you gave a domestic lamb rack every day to every chef, it would be very expensive, more expensive than the tuition. So um, it, it's just not done. So again, part of my plight is explaining to chefs at night. And the one good thing about working nights is that chefs usually get done with service at around 11 p.m. They come right over to our facility. When I walk them through and show them the possibilities and the different cuts, I mean, for a while, the uh, Beef Association was really pushing on economy cuts, thinking that the prices of the middle meats would be so high, especially in exporting um, uh, export ribs um, to the Pacific Rim, along with flat meats. Um, we, we, and they didn't want Americans to eat less beef. Finding those other cuts, those economy cuts that may lie inside the chuck and other parts that we would normally grind was really important. Uh, getting to show uh, chefs like that during the night, like what the possibilities are and the savings, what the savings are, um, it, it's a big, big help and it helps my plight in, in education. So you've basically gone from macroeconomics and meat to micro, right? I mean, th this is. This is really the front line of, of myself dealing with the general public. And we've done such a good job of marketing it and making the meat industry sexy that in 
at City Field where the Mets play, the New York Mets. Did a great job at the World Series. Um, they have an area that Delta pays them $1 million a year, just the right Delta, the Delta section, except that you can't see the game from that area. So the Wilpon family who owns the Mets asked me if I would put a steakhouse there. Now, I can't tell you how many offers I've had to open steakhouses. I cannot do that. I would be com directly competing with my customers. But inside the bubble of a stadium, it's not competition. So uh, three years ago, the first year we opened uh, the Chop House, and that is the uh, Patrick IV, a uh, little bit of a monster. But um, that was the first year Delta said that they thought their million dollars was worth it because people were now packing that side of the stadium. And um, if you could imagine, they pay a million dollars a year for that little font when my name is above it with Chop House. So, uh, and they're still happy. So, I mean, I always say my biggest regret is not knowing the power of a small business until later on in, in my career. A small business doesn't have red tape, doesn't have a board to answer to. You take risks, they are your own, but um, when you take such, that opened the possibility for us to open now at Madison Square Garden. So this is going to open Monday. Yesterday was friends and family, so it was a, the, our first run. So this is our uh, first bricks and mortar place that we actually are running ourselves. Um, it's 12,000 square feet and they calculate, it's 33rd Street and 7th Avenue if anyone is familiar. It's probably the, one of the most busiest streets in New York City. And the realty company that owns the garden asked us to be the anchor store in a food hall basically. So Mario Batali, I asked a few people yesterday, no one seemed to know who he is. Anyone know Mario Batali? He's one of the most famous chefs in America. Uh, he looks Scottish, he's Italian. Um, chubby guy, red hair. One day he may play Santa. Um, he walked in, he has a concept two, two down from, from ours, and he's a dear friend. And he walked in for the first time. We were working on this space for seven months. He had never seen it. He came in at 2.30. Gave me a big hug, excuse my language. He said, how the fuck do you get this space? And they put me in a little space in the corner. <laughs> like, Love you, Mario. <laughs> um, and we have a meatball sub, and we're all supposed to not compete. So there's like a lobster roll concept, a vegetarian concept a meat concept, and then Mario is somewhere in between. And how could I tell him he's conflicting with me? He's my customer. Um, so That was that same blogger. So after a certain amount of time and comfort, he went on to be the head food critic for Esquire magazine. Uh, Any time a blogger has interest in product like that, and it's media that you could trust, it's great to have them in. You want to show them that you have nothing to hide. You want to show them that you have a great operation. In this case, he didn't pay for it. I donated this um, four quarter for him, and I taught him how to break it down. And he took notes. At, it was because he was reviewing a restaurant. He wouldn't tell me at the time what restaurant it was. And what they did was use the clod and, and the neck meat for something very specific. And he got to learn where it was from. I became a little too trustful. And the producer from Dr. Oz approached me and said that he ate a 10-ounce hamburger that I made 
uh, in a restaurant once a week, and he was addicted to it. And he needed to know where it was from and the meat purveyor that made it, and he wanted to come film during production. And I just couldn't see how someone like Dr. Ross would suggest that that was a healthy thing. I always knew there was some trap somewhere, but he actually came in to meet me himself, ensured that it was something positive. I reminded him that he lived a few blocks away from me. Although I, uh, <laughs> he was still had a happy face and, and, and um, uh, was, was uh, very reassuring that it was positive. We let him come in and film, and I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but the USDA cannot be on camera. So I, have to, I had to get special permission from the USDA to film our, our production, and th my inspector stayed out of camera range, and it was great. I had one stipulation, and that was, it's a live show, so this is fi filmed beforehand. I just required to be on set, either on the panel or in the front row with a mic so that I could control the situation if he were to go off on a tangent and lie about something. Well, let's say it's a live audience of 200 people and I'm sitting in the front and the first thing that, that he did was play the video and I couldn't have been more proud. I mean, to see a clean facility and the interventions that we have when we grind our beef, it was, it, it was just great. The film ends, Dr. Oz comes out and says, can you believe that there are 23 different animals go into that hamburger? Right away I'm like, I'm screwed. He goes, that's the best case scenario. Usually it could be thousands. In the back of my head I'm thinking, well, if it's safe product, what does it matter? It's a blend. And the, where he came up with his numbers from, and I didn't catch on, he was asking me how much each chuck flap tail or boneless short rib weighed, the batch that we were making, um, and figured out that it would take 23 different animals to get that much bone, uh, chuck flap tail to put into that blend. And I could see behind him, behind this like translucent curtain, was a retail counter, and it was a, um, a supermarket, and right away I knew what he was, what, wh where he was going with this. I mean, he was suggesting that instead of buying ground beef from a USDA facility that has a preoperative inspection, an inspector, multiple tests, holding control programs for E. coli, salmonella, and the other five pathogens, he suggested to go to a, a retail counter in a butcher shop, pick out a single piece of meat, have the butcher then grind it for him uh, or his audience, and then go. I didn't give the retail butcher a chance to even comment. They were still behind the curtain. And Dr. Oz said, and do you know that this is made with all interskeletal muscle tissue? Well, what is that? Yeah, it's meat, it's steaks, it's muscle, it's, it's, it's what we eat. But in phrasing it like that, everyone's like, oh, that's horrible. So he gave the mic to me and said, Pat, what do you think about this food safety issues? I mean, Doc, I warned you and you gave the mic to the wrong guy. I said, you're now going to suggest that a non-inspected retail plant that does not clean their grinder, but maybe once a week if you're lucky, to choose a piece of meat from the showcase and grind it, meaning that a few thousand animals have gone through that grinder. Uh, and now, at, at best case scenario, you're telling the general public everything that's wrong, and you're putting them at risk. I said, I know you're going to edit this part out, um, but there are 200 people here that heard me say it, and he was just pale white. And he's like, I'm moving on, look at the feedlot that these animals are on. Now, at the time, it was strictly 
a Creekstone 100% black hide program that we had, and it was a photo. It was a photograph of a feedlot that had all red herefords. And I'm looking up at the photo, and whatever they lured the animals to the gate with really made it look like they were herding up. But behind them was a ton of empty space. So we said, look how crammed the conditions are. It's like, now I still had my mic. I'm like, uh, Doc, again, these are red Herefords. You're suggesting that those are mine. Um, they're not, but there's plenty of room for those animals. Look at how much property there is behind. He's like, right, get, get that mic back from the pad. I, with that, I stood up and walked out, and his producers called me uh, several times to double check uh, and fact check what I was saying. Needless to say, they never aired that episode. They cut it. It had to have cost them a half a million dollars uh, to, to, to do what they did, to, to travel around the country, to go to find a feedlot, to sucker somebody else into letting them uh, video. Um, and, and, and that's what we're up against. So when recently when he was in front of Congress, having to explain why he was uh, supporting certain berries that made you lose weight that he had um, equity in the, the production of, I wasn't surprised. You know? um, that's that's the, 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 the far left wing fringe that, that we have to fight against. But there's no other side usually to fight our battle. And I just think that uh, like I've heard this entire time to look at the science, the food safety, it's all there. I think that we're wasting a lot of money on making things organic or making the uh, certain claims. When we look at, at the numbers, they don't, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't require that extra money, and that message has to get out there. Um, I love the Horizon Milk example because my wife goes right to the Horizon Milk, and before we get out of the uh, grocery store, I always do the swap. <laughs> so for half the price, I'm getting a gallon of milk, wholesome American milk, <laughs> American dairy farm. Um, you know, it, it, it's that perception, and, and I, I really think that um, it's something that we need to have more advocates about. And I'll tell you, you'd be surprised. We all categorize the different news networks as this one's left wing, this one's right wing, this one's kind of center left. They will listen to both sides. I, I've gone on MSNBC before thinking the worst and they were some of our biggest fans. So I, it, it, it's, it's not something to be, um, it's not something to be worried about. As long as you get your say, and what you say is truthful, um, it, it's, it's very easy to debate against the 12 by 18 pet person. Very easy. And the reason that my heart rate went down is because yeah, maybe there were 25 PETA people amongst 200. I never got more emails from the other 175 guests thanking me for my response, thanking me for not getting shaken up because the chefs were, I, they were scrambling, hiding under the table. Um, <laughs> and and I, I was at peace because I knew what I was talking about, and they didn't. So. Again, I think education and getting the word out there is, is just vital. So it, in that education, like I said, we were very lucky to have the opportunity to be on many TV shows and to, and to really be a great proponent of, of beef, meat consumption. Um, I myself, suffered from stomach cancer in 2003. And my doctors tracked back what I ate as a kid, the genetics, and, and they suggested that I was eating too much processed meat as a kid. And my surgeon said, hey, Pat, you need to eat more of your own product. You need to cook it yourself. And 
I've done it ever since, and I, I managed to beat it. Um, but in, in all that success and, and positive outlook, I mean, to think that the Game of Thrones asked Lafrida Meads, I mean, we're a meat purveyor. What meat purveyor gets asked to host the, the new season of the Game of Thrones? My dad is like, the game of what? And meanwhile, the <laughs> what kind of a game is this? <laughs> is it on ESPN? I'm like, yeah, dad, just, just, just come. So, um, which uh, Chef Josh Capon, who cooked some beautiful tomahawk ribs, so uh, basically export ribs with real long bones, crossing them and serving them. That was, th those were the celebrities of the night. No one wanted pictures with the celebrities. Even the celebrities were taking photographs with the tomahawk steaks. Um, it, it was really a great event and just an, one example of, of where, with the proper positive outlook and, and um, I would say truthful information, like what, what the possibilities are for even uh, a meat purveyor. It, the two guys that take most of the years off my life, my dad and my cousin. So here's a perfect example. Dad, someone's coming later to take photos midday. I'm not going to be there. So make sure you guys have hats on, gloves, you're inside the building. <laughs> this comes on eater. My meat inspector's bringing it to me like, what's going on here? I'm like, well, uh, my cousin broke bought that himself retail for home. So as soon as you say retail, uh, they don't have jurisdiction over it. But my dad has a raw patty on a piece of paper. No hats on, they're outside on Washington Street. And, you know, just, they, let's just say that they, my dad needs supervision at all times. Uh, I, I think the, the, biggest, the biggest honor for me um, you know, I get to deal with a lot of c celebrity chefs, and, and that's a real, a real fun thing. So, is anyone familiar with the movie Goodfellas? Do you remember Janet Rossi? Um, Janet Rossi was played by Debbie Mazar. So, Debbie Mazar has her own TV show, uh, her and her husband, Gabrielle. So, that's Debbie Mazar, and right behind her is uh, her husband, Gabrielle, and that is myself, a little chubbier at the time, uh, to, to her right. Does anyone recognize the person around my right arm? That's Rob O'Neill. Rob O'Neill, the brave SEAL who shot Osama bin Laden. So after my military service, I was the um, chairman of the board for the Armed Forces Foundation, and it was my job to bring celebrity chefs to the military and to, have, to let them have that experience. Right after the raid, well before, I would never have shown this photo, but he's out now. Um, right after the raid, they sent the entire team to New York for a party and asked me to host them. I couldn't tell anyone who they were, though. So Debbie Mazar had no idea that she was standing next to the, the person who actually shot Osama bin Laden, which I thought was great. Uh, the gentleman in the red T-shirt is um, Mark Bissonette. He went by Matt Owen in the book that he wrote. Um, he also is out, so it's okay to show this photo now. Um, but I had held on to this for a very long time. Debbie Mazar still doesn't know that she stood next to the to SEAL Team 6 and the, um, the people who raided that home in Afghanistan, in uh, Pakistan. So um, again, this industry has brought me you know, experiences that I would never have had on Wall Street you know, on the best day. And uh, it's something very close to my heart, my family's heart, it's a way of life for us. And, um, as we saw that population growth graph, and you see that spike, my concern is 
how are we going to be able to supply um, proteins to our future generations? And it's something that um, I really feel uh, Alanco is going to be a big uh, solution to that, amongst many other things. But it's something that we really need to start to think about. Um, and we could spend an entire day on, you know, maybe we should, you know, exporting is great. And at a certain point, I think we may be closing it off to supply our own people. Um, it makes me nervous about, so right now, the border's closed with China. Correct, Chandler? Except it's not. There's a lot of American beef in China. All I have to do is ship it to Hong Kong, and they'll put it on a boat and bring it to China, and I have to hope to get paid. I'm like, no, thank you. I don't need to be in the middle of an international uh, problem like that. Uh, when Japan first opened up again, it was not beef that shut it down immediately. Bush got it reopened. And if you remember, it was veal from a company that I bought from, uh, which was Atlantic Veal out of Brooklyn. And the deal was that if you had product that was pa uh, slaughtered and packaged before a certain date, you could send it a uh, uh, after a certain date, sorry. Well, because they had shut the border, there were a ton of veal sweetbreads that were sitting in the freezer. And Atlantic Veal said, let's just, we'll get away with it. We'll just send it. Japan inspected that product. It predated the date that they had. And it froze the whole thing over again. And I know the owner, uh, Phil, had to get bodyguards. People really wanted to kill him because the rest of the veal industry and, and, and the meat industry was upset because, I mean, Japan is a huge market for us. So. Um, it's funny how one person and a bad decision could really halt international trade. But, um, well, that's it for me for now. We'll open for questions. Yes?